Hello, it's nice to be in uh, Detroit Tigers country, um, especially as a Red Sox fan, you know, I'm <laughs> sorry about the game last night, you know. But, you know, we had, we had over a century of misery in Boston uh, rooting for the Red Sox, so we may have more misery before it's over. We'll see. Uh, thank you so much, Barb, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Goodnow, and everyone who um, made it possible for me to be here. It's nice to be, uh, nice to be in Michigan. I also want to thank all the faculty who required their students to be here for extra credit today. I appreciate that. <laughs> So uh, it's nice to, have, nice to have you all here. L let, me, let me just start with one uh, preface or observation, uh, which is that there's two, there's two ways to talk about religion. Uh, there's, there's a religious way that happens inside synagogues and churches and Zen centers where people talk about their own tradition in their own language to each other. That's the sort of religious way of talking about religion, which is the way that most of us encounter conversation about religion in our, in our daily lives. We listen to a sermon in a church, we go to Sunday school, and our, uh, a Catholic nun or, uh, talks to us about the catechism. But there's also a, an academic or a non-religious way to talk about religion. This is maybe something like the distinction between doing art and being an art historian, right? There, you can do religion, but you can also look at religion uh, from a detached or um, scholarly perspective. The Supreme Court has made this distinction, one that it needs to make in terms of conversations about religion in public universities and also public high schools, when it talks about the distinction between teaching, the teaching of religion, which is unconstitutional in public schools, and then teaching about religion, which is quite and perfectly constitutional. So I see two kinds of conversations going on in American culture about religion, but what we're doing today, what, what I'll be doing today, is talking about religion in a non-religious way. So this is not a Sunday school class, this is not a catechism class, this is a different sort of conversation about religion. And the topic for today is religious literacy and the religious illiteracy in American life and why that ignorance that we share about religion matters both to us uh, as a nation and also to our, our interactions as citizens with, with the world. So I want to think about this issue of religious literacy in three uh, ways. I want to talk about the problem of religious illiteracy. I want to talk about how we got to this situation, the, the past, and then I want to make a proposal. So those are my three areas I want to touch on today, the, the problem, the past, and the proposal regarding our collective illiteracy about the world's religions and about uh, Christianity and the Bible. But first I want to say a little bit in a more personal vein about how I got to thinking about these questions, about talking about uh, religion in public. And it really began for me when I moved from Atlanta. My first academic job was at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And I had the perception there that when I was talking about religion that my students understood what I was saying. I'm not sure that was correct. That might have been the naivete of a beginning uh, professor. But when I moved to Boston University, I just noticed that my students didn't really seem to understand what I was, what I was talking about. I would, I would say Matthew, and they would think, Matthew Perry of Friends. <laughs> and I would say Luke, and they would think, you know, Luke Perry of 902, uh, 90210. And particularly what I noticed is my students started giving me the look. The look, as we all know, is uh, how you look when someone says something and you know you're supposed to understand what they're talking about, but you don't understand what they're talking about, but you don't want them to know that you don't understand what they're talking about. Right? So they started to do this. They started to go. <laughs> they started to give me the look like that. And so I uh, devised this quiz that I think a lot of you have, right? You were handed this out, many of you? No? Yes? Okay. 
So I, I thought, you know, I want to see what my students actually know. This is sort of rule one of teaching, you know, start where your students are instead of somewhere else. So I, you know, I was saying to myself, you know, my students don't seem to be understanding some of the shortcuts that I'm using. So what do they actually know? And so I, I developed this, this quiz about religion. I tried to come up with really easy questions. That was actually my goal. It wasn't to come up with stumpers. It was sort of, what are the simplest questions you can ask about Judaism or Buddhism or Christianity or the Bible? Starting with name, name the four Gospels. You know, list as many of the four Gospels as you can. I asked about the first five books of the Bible. Would people know that Genesis was the first book of the Bible, for example? Or, or what's the holy book of Islam, which would be, I hope you know, the Quran. And uh, what I discovered is my students didn't really know much at all about Christianity, the Bible, or the world's religions. And in fact, most of my students flunked uh, this quiz. They got less than 60% uh, uh, on the quiz. And the thing that intrigued me the most was the section at the end where I asked them to draw lines between uh, Bible figures and Bible stories. So connect the dots between Adam and Eve in the left column and then the, uh, the Garden of Eden in the right column, showing that they knew that that's where that story uh, took place. Those are the characters in that story. And I asked, as you can see on the sheet, if you have one, I asked about Moses, connect the dots between Moses and the parting of the Red Sea, connect the dots between Abraham and the story of the binding of his son Isaac. And my students did very poorly on this section, you know. As I was grading this, I, I was trying to conjure up stories about Moses on the ark and uh, Abraham being blinded um, on the road to Damascus. And the, the answers I found most intriguing on some, actually a lot of the quizzes I handed out, the students would just start with, start with Jesus in the left column and they would just draw a line to every story <laughs> you know, in the right column. I think they were thinking, you know, well, okay, I've actually heard of him. You know, maybe he has something to do with this story. So I then I shifted from my students to my own children. I moved into my own family, uh, asked the question, you know, what do, my, what do my kids really know about Christianity or the Bible or, or the world's religions? Because my, my father had, had been a medical doctor. He, when he came home from work, he really didn't talk about his job. He thought he was away from the home so much being a doctor, he should talk about with us about baseball or something else. And so uh, that's what he did. And so I, I realized that I had a similar kind of separation of spheres of separating my own work life from my family life. And I really didn't talk about religion much at all with my daughters, although they did go to uh, the local uh, Lutheran church where they were being raised on, on Cape Cod. And so I decided I should kind of check in with my kids about what they knew and the occasion that presented itself was Bible Day at the local Lutheran church. Now, Bible Day, do we have any Lutherans here? Can we have any shout out? Okay, we have a few Lutherans, all right. Uh, so on Bible Day in this Lutheran church, that was the day when you give the Bible to the second graders who have already been baptized as Lutherans, and on their baptismal day, their parents and godparents promised that they will put the scriptures in the hands of the children. And this is the day when you literally fulfill that promise by literally putting a copy of the Bible in the hand of these second graders. So, so it was Bible Sunday and my daughter was standing up there and they called the parents up and I stood next to her and they gave me this Bible uh, with a picture of Jesus on the front. Um, it was... Uh, it was actually not Jesus, by the way. It was because, of course, we don't know what Jesus looked like, right? So it was a picture of Jesus who pretty much looked like me, um, but with uh, a beard and slightly less handsome, I would say. Um, and he had, you know, a lamb on his shoulder, and he had these adoring children looking up at him. This is a children's Bible. So I handed the Bible to my daughter. 
and we went out in the car, and I thought, okay, you know, this is a teachable moment. Uh, let's, let's talk about the Bible, I said. And she said, okay. I said, why don't you tell me some Bible characters? And she said, okay. And then I said, you know, but not Jesus. You know, that's, that's too easy. Other people. And the car got very quiet. And I looked back in the rearview mirror, and my daughter's looking like this. She's giving me the look. And then she coughs. <clears throat> and then she coughs again. <clears throat> and then she says, Tom! It's like, Tom, you know? And then, you know, I'm a father. I want her to be right. So I'm thinking, all right, you know, doubting Thomas. Right? Maybe he was Tom to his friends. Um, but that was it. Jesus and Tom. So, um, so the nec next week, actually, uh, in the uh, Sunday school, the day was the story of Moses in the desert in anger, hitting the stone with his staff, and water comes pouring out, pouring out of the stone. And so uh, this time, both my daughters, my, my, my younger daughter and my older daughter, the younger daughter was the Tom, one who said Tom. She, uh, we got in the car afterwards, and I said, you know, so what did you learn, you know, in, in, uh, sc in school? This is like a good liberal Protestant New England kind of classic Lutheran Evangelical Lutheran Church of America church. And uh, my younger daughter, who had been stumped, you know, with Tom the prior week, she came out with so much information about Moses. It was as if she had been studying for a week about Moses. You know, Moses, the little baby in the bulrushes, he went to Egypt, he came back, he parted the Red Sea, let my people go, all the plagues of Egypt, uh -uh, all this stuff. Um, the Ten Commandments, you know, she was just loaded for bear with Moses' information. And then my older daughter, I said, well, what did you learn today? And she said, you know, I learned about water as a scarce world resource. I learned about condensation, precipitation, and evaporation. That's what she learned that day in, uh, in her Sunday school class. So these conversations with my kids and with my students uh, reinforce for me this sense of America's you know, ignorance about the world's religions and about Christianity and the Bible. And I was talking to a colleague of mine a few weeks later from Austria. He had come to the United States to teach a course for us in the Department of Religion on the relationship between Catholicism and Christian orthodoxy over historical time. It was a history course. And this guy was an expert. I mean, he was a, he was a Catholic, but his scholarly expertise was in Christian orthodoxy. And he was actually an advisor to John Paul II in the Vatican, uh, a really a wonderful person to be teaching this course. And he was so frustrated. He said, you know, Steve, I can't teach this course because my students don't know anything about Christianity at all. They don't know anything about Roman Catholicism. They don't know anything about orthodoxy. And he said, the course is just becoming a really basic intro to, uh, to Christianity course because they don't know enough for me to teach the course that I, I came to teach. And he compared it with his students in, in Austria. He said, in Austria, my students never go to church. But because they have mandatory religious studies education, they know a lot about the history of Christianity. But the students at Boston University, and he was teaching a lot of divinity school students, he said, they all go to church and none of them knows anything about Christianity whatsoever. So he helped to reinforce for me the basic uh, paradox that lies at the center of my religious literacy book and my work on religious literacy, which is that the United States is one of the most religious countries on earth, and yet Americans know almost nothing about the world's religions. They know very little about their own religions, and they know even less about the religions of other people. So as I started working on this, this book, 
I tried to find some survey data about the world's religions, uh, particularly about what we know about them. And there was very little because there hadn't actually been a survey done about US religious knowledge, what Americans know about the world's religions. But there were some haphazard uh, data in other kinds of surveys, typically surveys about belief and practice, surveys where people ask, you know, do you believe in reincarnation or do you believe Jesus is the son of God or how often do you go to church? There would be little snippets, one or two questions about religious knowledge mixed in. By the way, when people are asked how often they go to church by social scientists, um, they lie. <laughs> but what's interesting is they lie at a perfectly predictable rate. They double how often they go to church. So if they go to church twice a year, they say they go four times a year. If they go to church once a week, they say they go twice a week. So it's very easy for social scientists. You just ask people, and then you just divide it in half. So we have a very good sense of, and we know this, by the way, because uh, a colleague of mine who I was in grad school with, he got a bunch of money to send graduate students around to church parking lots. And instead of counting all the people in the church, which is tedious, you can just count the cars. And usually, I forget what the factor is, usually it's two people per car or something like that. So he just sent people all around the country to count cars for a year and figured out very precisely how much people go to church and they figured out who's exactly half of how often people claim that they go to church. So on these surveys asking how often you go to church or do you believe Jesus is the son of God or do you believe in God, there would occasionally be a question like, uh, do you know the Ten Commandments? That was one from a 1965 survey that intrigued me. Do you know the Ten Commandments? Unfortunately, the answers were either yes or no. So people would just say, oh yeah, yeah, I know the Ten Commandments. No one would say, all right, Come on, give me some Ten Commandments, you know. No one did that. Uh, we did find out, though, from some of these old surveys that most Americans cannot name uh, the, any of the four Gospels, either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Most Americans don't know the first book of the Bible is called Genesis. Uh, one out of ten think that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. It's good that you laugh, because sometimes, you know, I give this talk in New England, you know, uh, they're like, really? <laughs> uh, only about a third know that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people think Billy Graham gave the Sermon on the Mount. And a sizable, a sizable minority think that Sodom and Gomorrah were a happily married biblical couple. <laughs> Just a couple years ago, after I published the Religious Literacy book, there was actually a survey that was conducted by the Pew Forum that was in, in, in part a response to my book, a test of, of the, some of the hypotheses in my book, where they, the Pew Forum did do a survey of a few thousand Americans, a national survey, where they asked these sorts of questions, like the questions that, that are on the, the, the sheet that we handed out today that I had been asking my students. And what we found, not to our surprise, because I was a consultant to the project, uh, was that most Americans flunked. Uh, the average number right of 32 questions was 16, so it was a 50% average. The, the group that did the best on the, the survey were atheists and agnostics. They were the number one team in terms of knowing uh, information, factual information about Christianity, the Bible, and the world's religions. The, uh, the last place were Catholics. Sorry, my Catholic friends out there, but uh, last place was Catholics. Some of the questions on that survey, one of them was, what is the holy book of Islam? And only half of Americans got this answer right and said the Quran. Only half. It's kind of, that to me was astonishing. This survey was conducted in 2010. We had just had almost a decade of conversation about Islam in the wake of 9-11, where we had been debating, you know, is Islam a religion of peace? Is Islam a religion of war? Does the Quran tell you to be peaceful? Does the Quran tell you to be warlike? We had had pre, uh, pastors in Florida threatening to burn the Quran, front page news in newspapers all across the country. All this stuff for, for years had been going on, and yet 
Only half of Americans knew that the Quran was the holy book of Islam. We asked a more difficult question, uh, what is the majority religion in Indonesia, to try to get a sense of what people knew about world uh, religions around the world. Only a quarter of Americans knew that, that the dominant religion in Indonesia is Islam, even though the country in the world with the most Muslims is Indonesia. This is like the India to Hinduism. You know, India is where most Hindus live in the world. Um, Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country, and yet only a quarter of Americans knew that. We didn't ask if the Pope was Catholic. We thought that might be slightly too easy. But we did ask about the religion of the Dalai Lama. What religion is the Dalai Lama? Most Americans did not know that the Dalai Lama was a Buddhist. A lot of people thought he was, he was Jewish, um, the Dalai Lama. Okay, so this is academics. We like to do this, right? We like to laugh at dumb people, right? That, that's part of what we get part of what we get paid for. So, so, um, so what? So why does this matter? Why does it matter that Americans know so little about their own, um, their own uh, religions and uh, the religions of other people? Well, it matters because religion matters. Religious illiteracy matters because religion matters. Obviously, religion matters to billions of people worldwide in their personal lives, people who, who love Jesus, people who submit to Allah, people who observe the 613 Jewish commandments, people who worship uh, Krishna. But religion also has public power as well as private power. The so-called new atheists, these authors like uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens say that religion is the greatest force for evil in world history. I agree with that. But I would also say religion is probably the greatest force for good in world history. And you take those two theses together, and what you have is that religion is a powerful force that cannot be ignored by anyone who wants to understand the way the world has operated in the past and the way the world operates uh, today. Religion moves elections in the United States and in India. In the United States, politicians are eager to tell you, on for biblical reasons, what they think about abortion, what they think about gay marriage, or what they think about capital punishment, and sometimes what they think about taxation or, or poverty. Religion moves economies around the world. It affects the GDP in Dubai. It affects the GDP in, in Iran. It affects marketing in India. It moves military forces, as we all know, around the globe. So religion may not make sense to you, but you can't make sense of the world without making sense of religion. How to make sense of the BRIC economies without knowing something about Catholicism in Brazil and Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy in Russia, Hinduism in India, Confucianism in China in those BRIC economies, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, China. How to make sense of what's going on in Tibet without accounting for Buddhism, how to make sense of what's going on in Kashmir, where we have two nuclear powers facing off in a dispute about land, India and Pakistan, one a Hindu majority state and one a Muslim majority state. Obviously, the Middle East is not a quagmire that is purely based on political and economic disagreements. It's based on religious disagreements as well between Jews and Christians and and Muslims. Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State to Bill Clinton, she recently wrote a book called The Mighty and the Almighty. It's about religion and statecraft. And she talks in that book about how when she was Secretary of State, she had hundreds of economic and political advisors she could call on any time of the day or night if she had questions about the economy in Myanmar or the political situation uh, in China. But how many religion advisors did she have who she could call on? She had zero. So if she had a religion question, she had to figure out something as Secretary of State about Islam to make sense of what was going on in the Muslim world. I don't know what she did. She went on Wikipedia or something like that. She had no advisors in these areas. Now this makes sense if human beings 
are purely political and economic animals. If humans are motivated purely by greed and by power, then you can understand them simply with the advice from political scientists and, e and economists, if that's true, if that's a true understanding of human beings. But that's not the case. Human beings are, in addition to economic and political animals, they also are religious. Over 99% of the human beings who have lived in world history have been religious actors and they've been motivated by religious beliefs and practices as well as by their economic and political uh, interests. So that's what motivated me to try to think about this book because religion matters and because we know so little about it in the United States. So the problem, what, how do I identify the problem? The problem of religious illiteracy is obviously a religious problem for religious communities. If you are an evangelical member of a born-again church and you want to ensure that your children are raised up and have a born-again experience and become Bible-believing Christians, you obviously have a problem if they know nothing about the Bible. If you're Jewish or Catholic and you want to raise up another generation of Jews and Catholics in the United States and they know nothing about their Jewish heritage or about their Catholic heritage, you obviously have a problem. But that wasn't the focus for me in my book, the religious problem of religious illiteracy. There's also a liberal arts problem of religious illiteracy. Go into any world-class museum and look at pictures before 1950. Almost all of them, at least in the Western world, are going to be biblical pictures, Bible stories. Go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and look at their Asian art collection and try to find almost any sculpture that isn't a Buddhist bodhisattva or a Buddha or a Hindu god. That's what they are. That's what art is for much of world history in the Hindu and, and, uh, and Buddhist worlds. So it's a liberal arts problem. How do you understand the paintings of El Greco if you don't know something about the Bible? I would say you can't, or the music of Bach, or the poems of T.S. Eliot, or whatever uh, it might be. But again, that wasn't the focus of my book the liberal arts problem of religious illiteracy. The focus was the civic problem that imperils us as citizens of the United States, religious and otherwise. And I believe this civic problem it imperils us in two places. I want to talk about each, at home and abroad. So the problem, of the civic problem of religious illiteracy at home and abroad. So the home, as I see it, the domestic challenge is that we now have two religious political parties that repeatedly justify their public policies through appeals to Christianity and the Bible. Now we used to have one and we used to have zero, but the Republican Party in the late 1970s got together and decided that it would be an advantage to them politically if they talked about so-called family values in the public space and connected them to what they understood to be the history of Christian America. That would, that would work for them politically. And there was an agreement that was cut between what came to be known as the religious right and the Republican Party that that was going to be important to engage in what we now refer to as the culture wars. And it was a very successful strategy, both at the local level and at the presidential level. It helped to produce Ronald Reagan, who became our, our president in 19, 1980, and the so-called Reagan Revolution. The Democrats responded by saying that religion was a private matter. This is a very long-standing American tradition. The strict separation of church and state goes back to Thomas Jefferson. He said that religion was a private matter. It shouldn't be brought out in the public. It belongs in church and in the home. And in the public, we should give political reasons for things, not religious reasons. We shouldn't say 
we should do this about immigration policy because Jesus says so. We should do this about abortion because the Bible says so. We should have shareable, rational public reasons for things rather than biblically based or religious reasons. This turned out to be a bad strategy in a country in which 95% of the population believes in God, to be the anti-God party that the Democrats essentially uh, became in the 1980s and 1990s. And, and eventually, and that eventually was really after John Kerry lost uh, the presidency, his bid for the presidency as a Democrat, when he really didn't talk about religion at all. Finally, the Democrats said, hey, we're going to do this religion thing too. This is a good thing. Like, this works in America. People are religious. Let's talk about religion. And the Democrats really got religion when they moved into the 2006 and 2000, particularly 2008 presidential race. And we saw in the 2008 race primaries where we had whole debates that were, where we talked about the faith of Barack Obama and the faith of Hillary Clinton and the faith of other candidates who were vying with them for the Democratic nomination. And so the Democrats became, you know, a, a God party too. And so we now have two religious political parties that when they make arguments about tax policy or immigration, they connect those arguments to Bible stories. And yet, we as citizens don't know those Bible stories. We don't know if they're making any sense when Hillary Clinton says she opposes a Republican initiative restricting immigration because of the Good Samaritan story, because we don't know the Good Samaritan story. We don't know if that story makes any sense, if that's a useful way to think about immigration policy. Her argument was, here is a proposal coming from Republicans in Arizona that if you run into an illegal immigrant, you should turn them in to the authorities. She said, that's not Christian, because the Good Samaritan story says when you run into an immigrant, who's in trouble on the other side of the road, you should help them. You shouldn't turn them in. Because I'm a Christian, I oppose this immigration policy. That's what Hillary Clinton said. Democrats never would have done that before 2004. Does that make sense or not? Well, you can't evaluate it unless you know something about the Bible. What about the claim from the right that abortion is opposed in the Bible? Is that true or not? We don't know unless you know something about the Bible. Right? So I think there becomes a disconnect in our politics when we have our politicians talking about a text that the public doesn't know. And therefore, we're much more easily man manipulated by our politicians. We're much more open to demagoguery around religion because our politicians know that we don't know what we're talking about. And they can just say, because Jesus told me, because the Bible says so. And they're not going to get pushed back from media or from ordinary citizens because we don't know enough about Christianity in the Bible to push back. The problem abroad is even more dangerous in some ways. The problem abroad is kind of simple. It's that, it's that Madeleine Albright problem that we have a world that is furiously religious where people are acting economically, politically, and militarily all the time on the basis of their religious beliefs and yet we know nothing about Confucianism that will help us understand what's going on in China. We know very little about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam that will help us understand what's going on in the Middle East. So just to back up for a second, I'm not talking about just kind of being nerdy and knowing religious stuff because you should know stuff because this is my field that I got a PhD in and you should know something about it. I think if you want to be a business person, and you want to deal with China, which is a huge market for American um, goods and, and services, you need to know something about Confucianism. Try going to China and doing business without knowing something about Confucianism. You're not going to get very far. So from a, a very selfish, uh, selfish perspective, on the business side, it makes sense to know something. If you're, if you're going into the health field, you don't know anything about Ramadan. You're a nurse or a doctor. Your Muslim patients are not going to be taking pills in Ramadan in certain times of the day because that's the month of fasting. They're only going to be eating after 
after um, sundown. You need to know that as a medical professional. You need to know to ask. You know, oh, you know, are you a Muslim? Do you observe Ramadan? Are you taking your pills when we told you to take them in the, in the morning and at noon? Okay, so how did, this, how did this happen? This is our very brief historical interlude. For those of you who are allergic to history, you know, this would be uh, the time to take a, 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 like one of those brief power naps. Just tell your neighbor, you know, I'm going to zone out here, then they can jab you in five minutes when I'm done with a very quick history. But, so the warning, uh, history will ensue. So, you know, historians like to uh, kind of ov overturn the existing view. So I'll start with the existing view. And uh, the existing view is that we move from being a religiously literate nation, at least around the Bible and Christianity, because we really were such a nation. In the colonial period, most homes only had one book, if they had a book, and that book would be the Bible. And so literally the way kids would learn to read was by reading the Bible. So literacy and religious literacy grew hand in hand. They would memorize the Sermon on the Mount. They would memorize the 23rd Psalm. They would open the Bible. Their parents would open the Bible to the 23rd Psalm. And they would read, the Lord is my shepherd. And they would know it already and they would connect it with the words on the page. That's how kids learned to read in the colonial and early national periods into the late 1700s. So you would develop biblical literacy at the same time you developed literacy, the ability to read. And when we conducted our national debate about slavery in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, that debate was, to a great extent, a biblical debate. And it was very well informed, not just by elites, but by ordinary people who knew the Bible. They knew the Bible passages. Paul saying, slaves obey your masters the year of the Jubilee in the Hebrew Bible. They knew those stories. And we don't have that anymore. So the received wisdom is that this happened in the 1960s. This is what we hear from critics on the religious right. 1962 and 1963, two really important Supreme Court decisions in which the Supreme Court said no to devotional reading of the Bible in the public schools and no to official prayers led by school officials in the public schools. That this is when we broke the chain of memory that we used to have, at least between us as citizens and Christianity and, and the Bible. Religion became persona non grata in our, in our public schools. And it was secular people in the Supreme Court, those kind of nasty secular liberals in the Warren Court who took away our religious literacy. But my argument I make in my book is that actually this started a hundred years earlier, not in the 1960s, but in the 1800s, in particularly in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And it started with religious people, not with secular people. So if you want someone to blame for religious illiteracy, ironically, you need to blame Christians rather than blaming atheists. So how, how does that make sense? Well, what happens in the 1830s is we have this big awakening. It's usually called the Second Great Awakening. It's a period of revivalism. And in this period, a lot of people have born-again experiences. And evangelicalism becomes the dominant religious form in, the, in American life. It wasn't before. Before it was Puritanism. Puritanism, which is a kind of theology based on the thought of John Calvin in, in uh, Europe in the Reformation period. Calvinism was uh, an effort to really think about the Bible and about God's action in the world and in our own hearts, as well as to feel the experience of Christianity. So it was a, it was a conversion-based experiential religion, but it was also an intellectual one. Some of our greatest American intellectuals were Puritan thinkers. There was always a battle between the head and the heart. And what happens in the, in the, with the rise of evangelicalism and its replacement of Puritanism is that the locus of religion moves from the head to the heart. Religion becomes about feeling, 
becomes about experience. It becomes uh, about loving Jesus rather than knowing and wrestling with what Jesus had to say. It also becomes, because of an effort to Christianize the nation, it happens over the course of the 19th century and really finishes with the, the movement for prohibition in the early 20th century. It also becomes about morality, how to Christianize the nation, how to get rid of slavery, how to get votes for women, how to get rid of alcoholism through the temperance movement. This becomes as much of an emphasis of evangelicals in the 19th century as is evangelism. And, but in order to do that, in order to engage in all these, these social reforms that evangelicals were doing, almost all on the left, by the way, one of interesting shifts, 19th century born-again Christians are left and liberals. Late 20th century and 21st century born-again Christians are on the right and conservatives, right? But in order to do this work, this social reform work, like getting rid of slavery, which evangelicals saw as a sin, they needed to get rid of their doctrinal disagreements, right? They needed to not be fighting about Methodists and Lutherans and all that stuff. Don't be fighting about your denomination. Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Episcopalians, they all need to work together. And so in order to do that, they kind of agreed to just kind of stop talking about theology. Because when you talk about theology, it brings up all your disagreements. And after all, you have all this work to do in the world with Christianizing the nation, making it a more Jesus-driven place. So at the same time that religion is moving from the head to the heart and becoming more about feeling, there's also this imperative as religion becomes more about morality and social activism and politics is a push away from theology. And these two combine to produce the religious illiteracy that we see in the, in the 21st century. One more thing happens, and that is that religious people can't agree on what Bible to use in the public schools. When the public school system begins in the 1820s and 1830s, all the public schools are reading the Bible and teaching the Bible, and not teaching it as an academic subject, teaching it like Sunday school. That was one of the main purposes of the public schools, was to create moral citizens. And the only way a citizen would be a good citizen is if they were moral. And the only way they would be moral is if they would be religious. And the only way to be religious was to be Christian. And the only way to be Christian was to read the Bible. So they taught the Bible in the public schools. But you get to the 1830s and the 1840s, you start to get enough Catholic immigration, mostly from Ireland, in certain urban areas like Philadelphia, New York City, Cincinnati. And Catholics started to say, why are we reading the, the Protestant Bible in the public schools? This Bible has no notes, doesn't have Thomas Aquinas in the margins telling us what to think about this passage, doesn't have St. Augustine in, in the margins telling us how to read this, this Bible verse. That's not a Bible. So there was a fight between Protestants and Catholics about whether they were going to read the King James Bible of the Protestants or the Catholic Bible. And what happened in many school districts across the United States is Catholics and Protestants finally agreed on one thing, and that was to get rid of the Bible in the public schools. Because neither wanted the wrong Bible to be there, and they couldn't agree on what Bible to use. So many public school districts, long before, long before, you know, uh, the Warren Court in the 1960s got rid of the Bible in the public schools. Many public schools got rid of the Bible because religious people couldn't agree on which Bible should be read in the 1830s and the 1840s. There were riots in Philadelphia about this. People were killed over this, over which Bible would be used in the Philadelphia public schools in 1844. Okay, I'm done. You can wake up your neighbor. No more, no more history. The history danger is over. My students don't like history. They tell me uh, it was in the past. <laughs> so they're not that interested in history. I don't know if students here are different. OK, so, so um, here's my proposal I'll do before we quit and uh, get, have time for uh, questions. My proposal is that we should teach about religion in our universities, colleges. I think there should be a mandatory uh, course to graduate from college in the world's religions. I, I don't think 
uh, you should get out of college without knowing the difference between a Sunni and a Shia. I don't think you should get out without understanding why Iran is not going to be working with Al-Qaeda because they hate each other because they are on different ends of the Islamic world spectrum. Uh, I think you just should know that the Quran is, is the, uh, is the uh, Muslim scripture. And I don't think college students know that. And so I think, as, at least at schools that have mandatory, you know, some mandatory requirements, I think we should teach it. But what I focused on in my book was on religion instruction in the public schools, because the public schools is where we create citizens historically in American history since the 1820s. It's where we shape our citizens. And I think we should have two, two courses mandatory in our, in our public schools. One, a Bible course that would address the domestic problem, that would help us understand our politicians, figure out if what they're saying makes any sense. And a world religions course that would address the international challenges that we face of understanding the world, which I don't think we can do in a world that's so religious unless we understand the religions that motivate people in these foreign countries. Now, there are two objections to, to this proposal, and I'll, I'll take them each up. The first is that it's unconstitutional. And if you look at the 2010 Pew Forum survey, on U.S. religious knowledge, you will see a kind of catch-22 there, which is that most Americans believe both of my proposed courses are unconstitutional. Three-quarters of Americans think that you can't teach a Bible course in the high school, and two-thirds of Americans think you can't teach a world religions course in the public school. They think it's unconstitutional because of separation of church and state. This is false, and the Supreme Court has actually weighed in on this. So the Supreme Court, when it weighs in on religion and education, which it's done about 10 times since the 1940s, it almost always makes the distinction I made at the beginning of my talk between teaching about religion and preaching religion. And it says you can't preach religion in the public schools. You can't preach atheism in the public schools. You can't tell students what's right about the religious world but you can teach them about the world's religions. You can teach them the Bible. You can teach them about Christianity. This is what Tom Clark, Associate Justice Tom Clark says in the Abington v. Shemp decision in 1963, which outlawed devotional Bible reading in the public schools. He says, it might well be said that one's education is not complete without a study of comparative religion or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. It certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may not be effective consistently with the First Amendment. So not only does the Supreme Court say it's okay to teach these courses, it's saying it's a good idea to teach these courses because you're not really an educated person unless you know something about the Bible and the world's religions. The second objection is that it's too controversial. You know, this is the topic you're not supposed to talk about in public company, right? You go over to a dinner party, don't bring it up because people will start fighting with one another. Well, that's true on television. If you turn on the TV and people are talking about religion on Crossfire, you know, or Hardball, or one of these shows that sounds like it was uh, named in, by an adolescent boy, you know, um, people will be fighting about religion. They're doing the culture wars on TV. But if you go into an ordinary American town, into a school committee meeting, into a selectman's meeting, you find people who actually have to get along with one another in a way that TV personalities don't. They can just go back to their homes and never interact again with that person on TV until they're on TV with them again. And there's actually places all across the country where we have figured out particularly how to teach Bible courses. About one out of every eight U.S. public school district teaches the Bible as literature. They do pretty well with that course. It's way too few. 
should be seven out of eight instead of one out of eight. But thousands of, of uh, courses are being taught every year in America on the Bible as literature. We have a very successful experiment in Modesto, California, instituted about eight years ago with a mandatory course on the world's religions for ninth graders. This is a school district with a lot of born-again Christians and a lot of Hindus and a lot of Sikhs. Different religions, you would think, would be clashing with one another over how to teach world religions, and they figured out how to do that by involving community members and parents and teachers and administrators. The course is very successful, and I think it could be replicated in, in other places. Okay, so this is policy. Um, let me finish by asking about individuals. What about you? What about us? What can you do to address and improve your knowledge about religion? One thing you might have heard from a preacher someday is to read the Bible. And I will reinforce that. Read the Bible, but I'll give you a little trick. So the Bible's long, and in some places it's very boring. How many of you have read the book of Numbers? Really, very impressive. The book of Numbers is really boring, in my opinion, as is the book of Chronicles. But there's other parts of the Bible that are more interesting. And actually, my Cliff Notes recommendation, I hope I won't get in too much trouble for this, but is the Gospel of Matthew and Genesis. Just read those. Just read those. Why do I say this? If you look at literature and art in the West, 90% of the references that you find in literature and the visual arts are to those two books. The Gospel of Matthew, of course, is the longest of the Gospels. It has most of the parables. It's a very rare parable that appears elsewhere in the Bible that doesn't appear in the Gospel of Matthew. And, of course, Genesis has a lot of the sexy stories in the Bible. So you can read those, too, if you don't want to read the whole thing. Another is to read the Koran. You can read the Koran in one day very easily longest day, like six hours. You uh, sit down with um, a glass of lemonade or a beer, if you're not a Muslim, and you can read the Quran in the day. It doesn't take that long. You'll learn a lot from reading the Quran. You'll also be able to, if you remember part of it, you'll be able to check back on it when you hear people in public or on TV saying that the Quran says this or the Cran says that. It's something you can do that doesn't, won't take you much longer than reading, say, uh, The Hunger Games or something like that, which, by the way, I also recommend <laughs> The Hunger Games. Another is to talk with your friends about their religions. You know, um, some of you may know, you know people who are Jewish. Some of you may know people who are Muslims. Um, you can talk with them about their uh, faith. Um, more broadly, I would say, cultivate a curiosity about the world's religions. You know, why do Hindus uh, bathe in the Ganges? Why do Muslims get down on the floor to pray rather than praying in their seats like evangelical Christians do? What is the sound of one hand clapping? That's a little bit harder. But these are all questions that could pique your, um, your curiosity. Every year in, my, uh, in a class I teach called Death and Immortality, I tell my students that there's two worthy things to do uh, as they make their way through college. One of them is to prepare for a career, to support themselves and their family. And this is a worthy pursuit. But I think it's a pursuit that has, for some at least, overtaken an equally important pursuit, which is to find and wrestle with some big questions, to find some big questions that cannot be answered on a test or that might not even be capable of being answered in one lifetime. Often we think of the world's religions as answer banks. Jesus is the answer you might read on a billboard if you're driving as I was through Indiana recently. But religions are also repositories of big questions. They ask difficult questions as well as answering them, and sometimes they don't answer them. Why do human beings suffer is a central question in the Buddhist tradition. What must they do to be saved is a key 
question in the Christian tradition. What is freedom is a central question in the Hindu tradition. But in order to wrestle intelligently with these questions, we need basic religious literacy. So there are personal as well as civic reasons, as I see it, to learn about the world's religion. So as my students say, you know, that's just me. You know, what, what about you? Um, what do you think? 